All right, time to go teach. Hello and welcome to this, our first episode in the unit of The Cell, where we're going to introduce cells. So without further ado, our targets of the day. First target is explaining why in the world do we study cells. Second target of the day is listing the three different parts of cell theory. So there's something out there called cell theory, and we are going to explain what that is. And lastly, we're going to compare and contrast prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So clearly there are two different types of cells out there and we're gonna look at those two specific different types of cells. Let's get going. So first off, why cells? Why do we study cells? Well, because the first characteristic of life is that it's made of cells. So since the first characteristic of life is that it's made of cells, that means we should really study it and we should understand it because we're alive and that means that we're made of cells. We are made of at least a trillion different cells and we are carrying around a lot more than that, but it's really important that we understand a little bit about those things that make us up. When it comes down to cell theory, cell theory was designed and set up by these three different scientists, Matthias Schleiden, Theodor Schwann, and Rudolf Virchow. And I put the dates behind them just so you can see about when cell theory came to be. Now this is important because cells were actually discovered when a guy named Robert Hooke named cells. Hello, I just want to take a couple moments as an aside to talk about Robert Hooke and his amazing discovery of the cell. It happened in 1665 that he published his work about observing very small box-like structures within cork. And he referred to those box-like structures as cells because they looked a little bit like rooms to him. So that is how cells got their names. Now Robert Hooke's writings actually inspired a Dutch businessman named Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who was very experienced in making lenses because he wanted to be able to see the fibers within his fabric. So Anton von Leeuwenhoek, based upon the writings of Robert Hooke, decided to make his own microscope. And so he made this type of microscope. This is based upon his exact design and construction. It is a single lens microscope and using this little microscope he was able to see bacterium and he was able to see the first living cells. So it's all because of inspiration that Anton von Leeuwenhoek was able to observe living cells. And why his contribution is so important is because he took detailed and meticulous notes of what he observed. And we are then able to use his knowledge to gain an understanding. It wasn't the fact that Leeuwenhoek was a trained scientist. He wasn't. But his curiosity and the ordered way that he went through making his observations helped us gain a complete new understanding of the microscopic world. But you can see that we didn't come up with cell theory just instantaneously. No, it took a long time for cell theory to actually come about because theories are not just these little ideas. A theory is an overarching scientific concept that explains a broad range of phenomena. It's based on years and years of study and mountains of evidence that all come together to be unified in a specific way. And so that is how cell theory exists. And cell theory has three specific parts. First part of cell theory is one that you should already be very well aware of. It is that all life is composed of one or more cells. So first thing that came together for cell theory is to understand that all of life, wherever it is, is made up of cells. There's not a single thing alive that is not made of cells. Next, cells are the units of structure and organization for all organisms. 
Now, it's important to recognize one really huge key biological concept, which is that structure and function go hand in hand. So the specific structure that an organism has allows it to perform specific functions. So cells that have specific structures can perform specific functions, and those different functions are going to be important for either a cell that's a unicellular cell, a single cell, to be able to exist, so it can do all these different things, or when we're a multicellular organism like ourselves that has specialized cells that perform specific functions very well, but they don't really do everything very well, they rely on other specialized cells to do other functions. And so we have these different functionalities going on that all can work together to make the organism that we are. And lastly, all cells only come from previously existing cells. Cells don't just spontaneously generate. Cells that we have today only come from a pre-existing cell. That's the only way that cells exist, only through reproduction that we end up with new cells. Cells coming from a previously existing cell. And all the cells on our planet, and all the cells that we know about, right, they all fit into two categories. Prokaryotes, which is pre or before the kernel, and eukaryotes, which is having a true kernel. But what does that mean, and why did they have this name? When you're looking at cells, most of the time what we would do is we would fix the cells. And what that means is that we would take a slice of the cell and then we would stain them. And that dye would adhere to different parts of the cell. Specifically, it would adhere to the outer membrane of the cell, and it would also adhere to the structure that we would call the nucleus. And so, because some cells had that structure on the inside, we called them eukaryotes, and the cells that didn't have that structure on the inside, we called them prokaryotes. So it was all about if that structure was present to obtain dye or not. Some cells, we saw this structure. Therefore, we called them eukaryotes. The cells that didn't have that structure, we called prokaryotes. And so when we compare these side by side, we can actually look at a few different things. Prokaryotes, well, they don't have any membrane-bound organelles. And we should remember back to the biochemistry days, so in the biochemistry unit, in the lipids, we talked about membranes being made of this thing called a phospholipid. And that's how we had a phospholipid bilayer. So all membranes are made up of phospholipids, and they are that bilayer of the hydrophilic heads and the hydrophobic tails you know, facing in that double layer sandwich, and that is what makes all membranes. Well, prokaryotes, they don't have any internal membrane-bound compartments. They only have their outer membrane, which is the plasma membrane. That's what holds all of the prokaryote in but that's the only membrane that they have. <coughs> Almost all of them have a cell wall. The cell wall gives them a rigid structure on the outside. It gives them a little bit more structural stability. They do contain ribosomes. We'll talk about what ribosomes are for, what ribosomes do later on, and they are typically unicellular. I put typically there because I don't know of any multicellular prokaryotic organisms, but just in case there is one that gets discovered, I didn't want to be wrong. So I don't know of any that are not unicellular, but I wanted to be on the safe side. Eukaryotes, now eukaryotes, they do have internal membranous compartments. Those compartments are called organelles, and so they have these membrane-bound compartments that are, again, phospholipids, all right? Some have a cell wall, so plant cells, for example, have a cell wall. Animal cells, like our, our own, they don't have a cell wall. We don't have that rigid structure. They do contain ribosomes, so clearly ribosomes are important for life because ribosomes are found in both prokaryote and eukaryotic organisms. And Eukaryotic organisms exist both in a unicellular, but also in the multicellular fashion. So we are multicellular, so clearly, you know, animals are multicellular, plants are multicellular, you can see those. So just, you know, things to be aware of. 
When we look at a prokaryotic cell, this is pretty much the structure that you could look at. This is a generic prokaryotic cell. And you have the outer membrane, and then you have the DNA that is just floating out inside its cytoplasm, which is called the nucleoid. Cytoplasm just means cell stuff. It's just the stuff that happens to be within the cell. And so it's anything that is existing within the plasma membrane is called or part of the cytoplasm. All right, so this is the generic structure for a prokaryotic organism. The key here is just recognizing that the structure has this openness on the inside where we don't happen to have any internal compartmentalization because it doesn't have any membrane-bound organelles. And because of that, that's why we call it a prokaryotic organism. The only membrane it has is the plasma membrane, which is the barrier for the cell itself. On the other hand, eukaryotic cells, you can see they have all these different structural components on the inside. Those different structural components, those are all membranous sections. These are all formed using phospholipid bilayers. And the two main types of eukaryotic organisms that we talk about are plant and animal cells. That's not all of the eukaryotic organisms. There's also fungus, which are a multicellular organism that happens to have a cell wall, but doesn't have a chloroplast. It can't do photosynthesis like a plant cell can. And we also have many unicellular eukaryotic organisms. But plants and animals, these are the main types of eukaryotic cells that we are going to look at when we look at the different structures that take place and perform the different functions or the different characteristics of life. So we're going to go through and look at these different parts of the cell and see how each part allows the cell to perform the different characteristics of life. In summary, Again, all life is made of cells, and that's why we study cells, because we're alive and we want to understand what's going on, what makes our body work. Those cells are the basic structure that allows us to have our different functions. They make up the tissues which form the organs, which form the organ systems, which then form the organism that we are. And so all those different structural functionalities, those give us our organization. And those cells only come from pre-existing cells. When we get a cut, cells have to replace the cells that got damaged. When we grow, cells have to produce new cells so we can have more. And all those cells that exist upon this planet, they can be separated into two different categories, prokaryotic without membrane-bound organelles and eukaryotic, the cells that have membrane-bound organelles. So that's it for this time. Be awesome, stay awesome.